السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد So today inshallah ta'ala first of all I'd like to express how honored and overwhelmed I feel and the team that's following with me feel at the amazing hospitality and just the number of people that are here mashallah and I want to use this opportunity to remind myself first and foremost and then all of you that all of us whether we are are sitting and in, in the audience trying to listen or we are volunteers at the doors or speaking on stage we're all servants of Allah Azza wa Jalla no one is better than anybody else and the deen of Allah it does not need us we need Allah's deen we're going to come and we're going to go but the deen of Allah will move on we just pray that Allah Azza wa Jalla accepts the, the effort that we put in and the gatherings that we have to get closer to him and that all of us are rewarded and the barakah and the blessings that come from these kinds of gatherings are able to benefit us in our in our lives here and our next lives and also benefit our families in particular so tonight inshallah ta'ala i chose to speak to you about a surah that's very close to my heart uh, surah ar-rahman and obviously this time that we have is very limited and I won't be able to talk to you about the entire surah. Some of you that are familiar with my work know that usually I give a khutbah about one ayah. So I, there's no way I'm going to do Surah Ar-Rahman with you tonight, you know, unless we're going to be here until Fajr, which is not going to happen. So, um, so what I will do though is I, I, I'd really like to give you an introduction to this surah and at least talk to you about a first few, the first few ayat of this surah which are just incredibly powerful. And I think every Muslim should have an emotional relationship with these ayat. They're so easy, they're so small, they're so famous also. You listen to the recitation of Surah Ar-Rahman all the time. This is another reason I chose this surah, is because it's so easy for you to memorize. And I personally believe when you hear something about the Qur'an, like a lecture, a tafsir, an explanation of the Qur'an, then you don't want to lose it. You want to keep that with you. And the best way to keep that with you is you memorize those ayat. And so that's why, alhamdulillah, I did not pick an ayat from Surah, a passage from Surah Al-Baqarah for you today or the ayat of inheritance from Surah Al-Nisa. I picked very short ayat from Surah Al-Rahman that should take very little effort. From Many of you already know it. And for those of you who don't know it, you can do it very, very quickly. As a matter of fact, in your family, the first one to finish memorizing it, your father is going to give you 50. 50 ringgit. It's already guaranteed. So, sorry, dad. And that's, that goes for the wives too. If they memorize first, then husbands are going to lose a lot of money tonight. So, inshallah ta'ala. Because I really want you guys to memorize it. And that's, that's really how we should move forward with Allah's book. Now, the Adhan is going to happen in about 13 minutes, which means I don't have much time to give you an introduction. So I'm going to pick and choose. I'll just have, there, in my mind, there are several segments of this conversation. So I'll at least share the first segment with you. So, the first thing I want to talk to you about is that there, there are three elements, there are three ingredients of effective communication. Now I want you to pay attention because I'm going to ask you later what they are. How many ingredients are there of effective communication? Three. The first of them is content. What are you going to say? You should say something that is meaningful, purposeful. You should say something that is true. You should say something that is beneficial to somebody else. All of you, inshallah, all of you have friends, hopefully. And sometimes your friends talk a lot, but they don't say anything meaningful. Or you're on the phone with somebody for an hour, but they actually haven't said anything. There is something missing in the content. I, for example, spend a lot of time listening to uh, preachers of other religions on the radio in Texas. It's a hobby I have. And I try to listen very carefully for content, but after half an hour, I realize they actually haven't said anything yet. But the crowd loves it. So content is really important. Another example of content that I, I think is easy to understand is in the United States, you know, very recently we had an economic crisis. You know about that. And in the economic crisis, 
they had these corporate executives that were responsible for all kinds of unethical deals. And they were brought to Congress to testify. And they were asked very simple questions. Did you sign these documents? Now, when you ask a question like, did you sign these documents, the answer takes one second, less than one second. Either you say yes or you say no. But the guy starts by saying, you know, when I was a child, my favorite lollipop was red. And then, I, you know, and then he goes on for 45 minutes until the Congress session is over and they say, we'll have to come back tomorrow. So he's trying to give you useless content so he doesn't have to testify. Content is the first key to effective communication. The second key, the second key is style. It is not only what you say, it's how you say it. It's not just what you say, it's how you say it. I can testify to this myself. Every khutbah, every khutbah that's given has something good in it as far as content. There is probably an ayah of the Qur'an in the khutbah. There's probably a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the khutbah. Isn't that true? Which means that there is nothing wrong with the content. But sometimes the khatib can be so boring. It's like he's releasing sleeping gas from his mouth when he's talking. People get some of the best sleep of their life in the khutbah. The only time they wake up is when he says, Aqim salat They're like, oh, okay. And then they get up and they pray. So sometimes the content is good, but the style is a problem. You have to have a style that gets people's attention. You have to have a style that keeps people awake. You know, so that's the second condition. And it's not just about public speaking even inside your home. How many people here have teenage children? Teenage children, if you have them, raise your hand. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Okay, good. If you have teenage children and you tell them to come to the table for dinner, how many times you call Zubair? How many times you call Muhammad? One time? Zubair, come for dinner. Immediately, yes sir, and he's there? No. Zubair, come for dinner. Zubair, come for dinner. Zubair. <laughs> and you have to keep going. You have to do that. Because clearly talking to him once, or talking to him nicely to Zubair, sorry Zubair, but talking to Zubair nicely is not the style that works for him. You need some other style for Zubair. So Zubair, and then he's, you know, okay, okay, I'm coming, God, you know. Then he'll come, maybe. So that's the second. What was the first ingredient of effective communication? Content. Second, style, style. And before I move on, I should tell you a little bit more about style. Some of you, it'll save your marriage. There are different ways of saying things. You can, it's the same content. Maybe your wife made dinner. She put a lot of work into it. She was spending her day at work. She came home early. She cooked dinner for you, your, your favorite meal. She had it on the table before you even got there. And you're about to start eating. And you notice it's a little less salt than you're used to. You could use a little bit more salt. So what you want to say is, I want more salt. But there are different styles of saying that. <laughs> I mean, you could say, this is the most amazing dinner I have ever had. This is the food from Jannah. <laughs> if I had it some salt, it would be from the seventh level of Jannah. <laughs> Can I have some salt? Like this. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is, woman, is the economy that bad? You couldn't put some more salt in this food? By the way, I hate your mother, etc., etc., you know. <laughs> There's, if you're saying the same thing, the food needs salt, but there's different ways of saying it. Same style, same, same content, different what? Style. One style will make your life easy, and the other style you'll sleep outside. Right? So <laughs> you got to be careful with your style. So there's content and there's style. And finally, lastly, and this is probably one of the most important ingredients, you have to know who you're talking to. You cannot talk to two different people the same way. The way I talk to my child is not the way I talk to my father. It's not the same, even if I tell them the same thing. Even if I say, I'm going to the masjid, come with me. Come with me. If I say, come with me to my father, it's not the same as when I say, come with me to my son. Is it the same? No. The content is the same. But depending on who I'm talking to, I change. The same is true of a classroom. Your teacher, or if you're a teacher, you don't talk to all the students the same way. 
There are some students that listen very, caref- very k- quickly, immediately. And you call them over and you tell them in their ear once and it's done. There are some students, you have to talk to them and there's another language that we use in the Muslim Ummah besides talking to communicate with students sometimes and then we use that to talk to them because there's different kinds of students. You have to know who you're talking to. So this, these three things, if you can master them, then you will have good communication. Now why am I putting all of this in my introduction? In these like three minutes that I have left or six minutes that I have left, I want to share with you why. The Qur'an, the book of Allah, the speech of Allah is perfect speech. It is the best communication in existence. Nobody communicates better than Allah. We communicate, but all of our communication was taught by Allah. Our teacher is Allah. Nobody speaks on this earth except that Allah taught them. So when He speaks, you cannot compete with it. There's no comparison. Now when Allah has perfect speech, what does that mean? That means He has the best content. Number one, He has the best content. What's number two? He has the best style. And He's always considerate. He's always very accurate about His audience. Every surah in the Qur'an, even sometimes passages in the Qur'an have a very specific audience. Allah talks to one audience one way. Allah talks to another audience another way. Allah talks to Jews one way. Allah talks to Christians another way. Allah talks to mushrikun in the first year of the seerah one way. And Allah talks to the mushrikun in the tenth year of the seerah another way. The audience is different. The people who come to visit Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah gives ayat to tell them. There's different ayat. Allah does not say to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I already revealed tawheed to you, pick one of the surahs and tell them. No. He gives them a special ayah, special surah for them because they need a special message, you understand? So when we talk about Surah Ar-Rahman today, we have to understand something about its content. But if you really want to under, understand its content, you have to understand its style. And if you want to understand its style, you first and foremost, before anything else, you have to understand its, fill in the blank, audience. Who was Allah talking to when Surah Ar-Rahman was revealed? Most accounts are that Surah Ar-Rahman is either early Madani, and most, most are that it's actually late Makki. And from the style of the surah, it appears to be a Makki surah. It's a late Makki surah. Now what was happening in late Makkah? The mushrikun had become extremely stubborn. They did not want to hear the message of Islam. They said, we've been listening to this for 10 years. It's the same speech over and over again. Even Allah says, كَذَلِكَ نُصَرِّفُ ayat." We keep changing the ayat. The message doesn't change. The ayat change. And they say, yeah, we've heard everything already. Stop. We don't want to hear this anymore. We're not interested. And it's not enough that they're not interested. They start attacking the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَإِذَا عَلِمَ مِنْ آيَاتِنَا شَيْءً اتَّخَذَهَا هُزُوًا Every time he came to know something about the Qur'an, something about our ayat, he tried to make a joke out of it. So it's not only that they're not interested, now they make fun of the Qur'an when the Qur'an is recited. لا تسمعوا لهذا القرآن وألغوا فيه لعلهم يرجعون Don't listen to this Qur'an. Make noise when the Qur'an is being recited. The believer is told فَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنِ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْصِتُوا When Qur'an is recited, be quiet. Listen carefully. فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ Listen carefully. وَأَنْصِتُوا And stop talking and listen. أَنْصِتُوا in Arabic means two things. Number one, stop talking. And number two, listen, both. وَأَنْسِتُوا You know? لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ so, And they said, uh, they said, don't listen to this Qur'an, make a lot of noise. This is what they said. In other words, they became extremely stubborn. Now I have two minutes left. I didn't finish my introduction, but I want to leave you with one point. When you, young guys, how many teenagers in the audience? Teenagers? إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Okay. Teenagers are playing football. Teenagers are playing basketball. Teenagers are hanging out and somebody bumps into you. Teenagers have very hot temper. What you do? <laughs> and they're ready to fight. And when they're about to fight, the friend holds you back. No, 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 it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Let me go. You know, and he doesn't want to, he wants to fight. 
So your friend who's holding you back says to you, calm down. He said, how do you say calm down in Malay? I didn't hear you, forget it. <laughs> It'll take me so long to learn that. Okay, so <laughs> calm down. Now, your friend says to you, calm down how many times? One time? When your friend says calm down, you say, oh, I, I didn't realize that I should calm down. I should sit down and <laughs> sip on some tea now. Like, you don't do that. <laughs> if because you're crazy at that time, he says, calm down, calm down. Hey, calm down. Hey, listen to me. Listen to me. Calm down. Relax, relax. He says it 10 times. And you are so angry at the time, maybe, maybe you heard it one time. Maybe. And then you listen. Because at that time, you are stubborn. When you are stubborn, you cannot be told something one time. You have to be told lots of times. The people of Mecca had become what? Stubborn. So Allah says, فَبِي أَيِّ أَلَىٰ إِرَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ فَبِي أَيِّ أَلَىٰ إِرَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ فَبِي أَيِّ أَلَىٰ إِرَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ Maybe you will get it one time if it's said that many times. You understand? You ha that, that is the style of this surah. But the style is there for a reason. Because it's talking to a certain kind of audience. Doesn't that change your perspective on the surah? So this is just the first part of my introduction. This is the introduction to my introduction. Now it's time for the adhan, inshallah ta'ala. And right after the adhan, I'll continue. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Thumma amma ba'd. So we were talking about Surah Al-Baqarah. And wait. What were we talking about? What were we talking about so far? What did we talk about so far? The four elements of communication. Three? Okay, what are they? Content? Style? So what kind of audience is Surah Al-Rahman originally? Stubborn people. Stubborn people. That's what I gave you so far, yeah? And now we know something about its style. Its style repeats itself, and that's very suitable for who? Stubborn people. Stubborn people need to hear something more than once for it to get inside their head. So there's this one message that is so important in the surah that Allah wants to instill into the people that are very stubborn, but they're just not getting it. So they have to hear it like many, many times. And what is that one message? But more about that a little later. I want to talk to you now, inshallah. This is still part of my introduction. I li I'm a student of the, the order of surahs of the Qur'an also and how Allah organizes lessons in the Qur'an. And what I want to talk to you now about before I talk about Surah Al-Rahman is the next surah a little bit, just a little bit. What is the next surah? Does anybody know? Surah Al-Waqi'ah. Surah Al-Waqi'ah. Surah Al-Waqi'ah is interesting. It has a number of subjects. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list five of them in order. What are the five main topics of Surah Al-Waqi'ah? I just want you to pay attention and see if you can remember. If you can remember, I am impressed. Because I know it's a lot. Five is a lot. Three was easy. This is five. So, five topics of Surah Al-Waqi'ah. The first of them, the first main topic that comes up, Allah calls them As-Sabiqoon, As-Sabiqoon, Ula'ika Al-Muqarrabun, Fi Jannat Al-Na'im. The first and the foremost, the highest ranking people in Jannah. Allah talks about them first. That's the first main topic of Surah Al-Waqi'ah. Okay. The second topic of Surah Al-Waqi'ah, the main topic, is Ashabul Yameen, the people of the right hand. Now, people of the right hand are also people of Jannah, yes? But Allah first talks about As-Sabiqoon, as -sabiqun, meaning the premium package, the higher level. The best people. Then he talks about everybody else who also made it on board. So there's first class and there's economy class, Jannah also, but it's mentioned. So two classes of people. But they're both good. They're both making it. They're both saved. Okay. The third section is Ashabu Shimal. Ma Ashabu Shimal. The people of the left hand. The people of the left hand are, are safe or in danger? They're in danger. So we've got two groups of people that are safe. As-Sabiqoon, as -sabiqun, the first and the foremost. Then Ashabul Yameen, people of the right hand. Then Ashabul Shimal, people of the left hand. How many subjects did I say the surah has? 
It has five, five main topics, and there's an introductory passage and there's a concluding passage, but five in the middle. I'm talking about the five in the middle. So one was as sabiqun as sabiqun two was Ashabul Yameen, three was Ashabul Shimal, four, four is Allah makes a list of some of the things that only Allah can do. You can't do it. Antum tazra'unahu am nahnu zari'un. Antum tahruthun. Are you planting seeds? Are you making the plants grow? Are you making the crop come out? Are you sending the water from the sky or we do that? Who does that? So he's, he makes a list of things that only he can do and we cannot do. That we see all around us. He puts, makes us humble. He makes us humble by showing us that he does things that we are incapable of. These are some of the creations of Allah. That can only be creations of Allah. They cannot be creations of ourselves. Right? So I'll give it a simple topic. The creations of Allah. The creations of Allah. Let's start from the beginning. We have four topics now. What was the first one? As-sabiqun, as-sabiqun. What was the second one? Ashabul al yameen What was the third one? Ashabu shimal What was the fourth one? The creations of Allah. The creations that can only be Allah's creation. They can't be our creation. And the fifth one, the final one, is actually فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِعِ النُّجُومِ وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمُ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ It is a passage about the greatness of the Qur'an. It is about the Qur'an itself. How Qur'an is awesome. And it's actually one of the most beautiful places that describes the power of the Qur'an. Previously at George Mason University, I think the lecture is on YouTube somewhere, I talked for an hour or two just about this ending of Surah Al-Waqi'ah. And how incredible Allah describes the power of the Qur'an at the end of Surat Al-Waqi'ah. These are the five main subjects of Surat Al-Waqi'ah. The last one was the greatness of the Qur'an. I'm going to see if you guys remember now. Number one. I don't hear you. as As-Sabiqoon. The first and the foremost. Number two. Ashabu al-Yameen. Number three. Ashabu al-Shimal. Number four. The, the creations of Allah. And number five, the greatness of the Qur'an. But I'm not talking to you today about Surah Al-Waqi'ah. I came to talk to you about Surah Al-Rahman. Surah Al-Rahman also has five subjects. Five subjects. Subject number one, the greatness of the Qur'an. What was subject number five in Surah Al-Waqi'ah? The greatness of the Qur'an. Subject number one in Surah Al-Rahman is Al-Rahmanu Allam Al-Qur'an That's the greatness of the Qur'an being talked about Okay Subject number two in Surah Al-Rahman Is Allah's creations Al-Shamsu Al-Qamaru Bihusban Wal-Najmu Wal-Shajaru Yasjudan Wal-Samaa Rafa'aha Wa Wada'a Al-Mizan Oh my God, and it goes on That's subject number two the last subject of Surah Al-Waqi'ah was the greatness of the Qur'an. The first subject of Surah Al-Rahman is the greatness of the Qur'an. The second last subject, backwards, subject number four of Surah Al-Waqi'ah was what? Creations of Allah. And the second subject of Surah Al-Rahman is creations of Allah. The third subject of Surah Al-Rahman is judgment day, criminals that will end up in the hellfire. That's subject number three. What was subject number three backwards in Surah Al-Waqi'ah? Ashabu shimal Same people? Then subject number four, Allah says, وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَانِ Allah gives two jannahs to people who feared him and he starts describing a jannah. And a little bit later he says, وَمِن دُونِهِمَا جَنَّتَانِ And above and beyond that, there's even a better jannah I got for you. There's two more jannahs. So he talks about Jannah two times. One time a, a beautiful Jannah and then he says, I got even a better Jannah for you. So you could say Jannah regular and Jannah deluxe package. Four and five. Jannah and better Jannah. What was subject number one and two? As-sabiqoon, as-sabiqoon. Ashabul yameen. The best of the best get the best Jannah. Subject number one and subject number five. Subhanallah. This is how Allah teaches lessons. Those of you that are teachers in the audience, sometimes when you teach a lesson and it's got five parts, a chapter has five lessons. When you review it, what do you do? Sometimes a good way to review a lesson is go in reverse. Five, four, three, two, one. 
And this technique is something Allah Himself teaches us in the Quran. This is one of the things I'm a student of. I like to study how ayat are organized in the Quran, how Allah constructs arguments in the Quran, how He makes us learn lessons that we won't forget. And it's hard to forget after this. If you can remember the five lessons of Surah Al-Rahman, you will already look for the five lessons repeated again in reverse order, in perfection, in Surah Al-Waqi'ah. This is still again introduction. We haven't started the surah yet. Now we got to get inside the surah, inshaAllah. So how many sections are in Surah Al-Rahman again? Five. I hopefully, hopefully I can talk to you only about the first section today. If I can do at least that much, Something of my job is done. Something of my job is done. This surah is unique for many reasons. And one of them is that Allah Azza wa Jal began this surah with one single word that is an ayah by itself, but it's not from the mutashabihat. You know, alif la meem is an ayah. I don't know what that means. You don't know what that means. Allah Ta'ala A'lam. Allah knows. But, and, but that's one ayah. Ar-Rahman is one ayah. It's one ayah. But it's not like only Allah knows what that means. He taught us what Ar-Rahman means, yes? And for those of you that are students of language, Ar-Rahman u'allam al-Qur'an is actually one sentence. It's one sentence. Ar-Rahman u'allam al-Qur'an. But Allah broke it up. So Allah took one sentence and put it in two ayat. Why would he do that? You don't do that in English class. You don't do that in English class. You don't say Allah, full stop, created us, full stop. If you do that, your teacher will mark you wrong and you say inspired by Surah Al-Rahman at the bottom. <laughs> you know, you give dalil for your... <laughs> it's not going to work. Trust me, it's not going to... I tried. It, it doesn't work. Okay. But let me tell you why Allah does that. One of the reasons Allah does that, Allah tells us Himself in His book, He says, So people could do deep thinking about each and every one of His ayat. If it was one sentence, then we would think about the whole sentence as one ayah. But Allah wants me to think about it and you to think about it. He wants us to think about just Ar-Rahman by itself. Before you think about Allam al-Qur'an. You should not think about Allam al-Qur'an until you stop and reflect and think about just Ar-Rahman. We would not have stopped and thought about Ar-Rahman by itself if it was one ayah. We would have just said Ar-Rahman Allam al-Qur'an. But he said Ar-Rahman. Stop. This is an ayah. This is an ayah by itself. Subhanallah. So we got to stop too. We can't just go on. We have to stop and think about this word. What does it mean? Where does it come from? You know, we use this word all the time. We say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We say Fatiha all the time. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We use the word all the time. But what does it mean? Can anybody give me an English translation that you've read before? Ar-Rahman, anybody? Merciful. Uh, some people use benef beneficent, right? Compassionate. I, I don't know, beneficent. Have you ever used beneficent in a conversation with anybody before? I mean, does that ever normally come up in conversation? Because if it does come up, see me afterwards, I know a psychologist. You, know, you, know, <laughs> you don't normally use the word beneficent in conversation, yes? The purpose of translation, the purpose of translation is so you and I can understand. And translation should be with words that you can actually use that you actually relate to. If you translate with words that you can't relate to, then it defeats the purpose of translation. It defeats the purpose. And the other problem is, the, the easier word is merciful. Merciful is easy to understand for most people who understand English, they know the word merciful. But the problem with the word, there's also a problem with this word, is that it's actually different from the word rahma. Mercy is different from the word rahma. And I first want to explain that difference to you. Ar-Rahma in Arabic comes from a few things. One of them is Ar-Rahm. Ar-Rahm is the stomach of the mother. When a woman is pregnant, her stomach is called Rahm. And it's called Rahm because that baby is taken care of in every way. Ar-Rahm is 
uh, 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 the, the child inside the rahm of the mother is taken care of in every way. Now there's a relationship between the mother and the child. Does the child know the mother? No. Does the mother already know the child? Something about that? Does she already have love for the child? Does the child have love for the mother yet? No. Is the mother taking care of the child already? Yes. In every way. In every way. The entire world of the child is taken care of by the mother. And the child has no idea, no clue that he is loved so much that the mother is willing to do so much for this child and protect it from every danger. Protect it from every danger. You know, the, 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 uh, uh, normally human beings, when they protect themselves, when they protect themselves, we protect our head, we protect our bodies. But a mother, before she protects anything else, what will she protect? Her stomach, when she's expecting. She's going to be extra careful not to walk in a narrow place or to stay away from corners at the table. You know? She's going to take extra caution. That word gives birth to the word rahmah. Rahmah is not the same as mercy. Because mercy in English is used when you spare someone. Like for example, I was going to beat you up but I showed you mercy. Which means you were expecting punishment and when I decided not to punish you, that means I showed you mercy. Maybe a police officer stops you on the road. The policeman comes over to you, hey, you don't know the speed limit? No, I, I was reciting Surah Al-Rahman. Uh, sorry, I just... <laughs> Okay, okay, I'll show you mercy. No ticket for you. I don't know if that's going to happen. Don't try it. But you were expecting punishment, yes? You were expecting a ticket? And then you use the word, oh, he showed me mercy. Meaning he let me go. In other words, in the English language, most of the time when we use the word mercy, we're actually thinking about punishment. And then the punishment went away and we thought about mercy. But the word rahmah has nothing to do with punishment. The word shouldn't even cross your mind. The thought shouldn't even cross your mind. It has to do with complete care and love. Someone who shows you rahmah is someone who has ta'attuf and riqqa. Like Lisan al-Arab ibn Manzur, the lexicon of the Arabic language, he argues. Someone who has compassion towards you. Someone who wants to be soft and easy with you. Someone who wants to make things delicate for you. They understand that you should be handled with care. You know, there are people who deal with other people delicately, nicely. And then there are people who are not very delicate, not very nice. Sometimes you want to get a visa to some country and the person you have to deal with is not very nice. They don't have riqqa. But if they have rahmah, they treat you with respect. They start with salam. They say, I'll do everything I can to help you. And you can notice they care about you. You're trying to do hajj or something and they care about you, you know. They're showing that riqqa. That's rahma. Rahma is to show love, to show care, to be sensitive. When Allah calls himself ar-Rahman, he is saying that he loves you. He is saying that he cares for you. He's saying that he understands that you are very delicate and you must be handled with care. And Allah will take care of all, every matter that you have. He'll be very delicate in your case. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to abandon you. A mother would never abandon her child. Even above and beyond that, beyond imagination, is Allah Azza wa when He calls Himself Ar Rahman. But another thing here is Ar Rahman, the word itself is what's called Sigatul Mubalagha in the Arabic language. What that means is something that is excessive and unusual. Like if you are thirsty, if you're thirsty, that's one thing. Or if you're angry, that's one thing, ghadib. Even atish, if you're thirsty. But if you say atshan, that means you are dying of thirst. That means if you don't drink, you're going to die. You could not be thirstier. Any more thirsty than this and you will be dead. Ghadib is angry in Arabic. When you say ghadban, that means if you get any angrier than that, you'll explode, man. Your head will pop off your body. You know? Allah says, Ar-Rahman. You know what that means? You cannot be more merciful than that. That is the nth, the most extreme, unlimited form of mercy. Extreme mercy, beyond imagination. The other thing that comes from the language of this word, Ar-Rahman, because it's Sigatul Mubalagha, 
the origin, some grammarians argue, of mubalagha is ism fa'il. What that means in simple terms for everybody here, I know not everybody is an Arabic student, is that it is happening right now. It's happening right now. It's one thing to say Allah cares. It's one thing to say Allah is loving. It's one thing to say Allah protects. But it's another to say Allah is protecting me when? Right now. He's caring about me right now. He's concerned with me right now. He is delicate with my situation right now. That is the realization inside Ar Rahman. It forces me to think and it forces you to think how is Allah showing me love right now? Immediately. Not tomorrow, not later. Every one of us has problems. Every one of us. Maybe you have family problems. Maybe you have husband problems. Maybe you have wife problems. Maybe you have children problems, parent problems, in-law problems, boss problems, worker problems, government problems, immigration problems, economic, you got problems. And we think about our problems all the time. And we don't think about Ar-Rahman all the time. We only think about the problems. We don't think how many problems Allah saved us from. Somebody gets allergies and they complain about their allergies, but they don't think the nose is still on my face. That's Allah taking care of you, my friend. It could be so much worse. There's so much worse that can happen. When a child is born, how many things can go wrong? For those of us that have healthy children, we complain about the grades of our children. They don't pay attention in school. They don't do their homework on time. They com parents complain and complain and complain. If you say, what do you, what do you say about your child? You know, and they'll give you a list of complaints. You know, doesn't go to sleep on time, talks back, doesn't finish dinner, watches too much TV, video games all the time. You know, this, that is a long list. But you know what? If you ever talk to parents who lost a child, if you ever talk to parents who lost a child, you know what they say about their child? They never say he never did his homework, he was always late to school, he always ate too, too little, he was always watching TV. They say, my child was perfect. He was so perfect. He was the best. They only remember the good things. Why is that? A day before you were complaining. You were yelling at him. Because that's human nature. We don't appreciate the things that we have until they're gone. When they're gone, we remember. Now, right now, we're not thanking Allah. We're not realizing how much love He's showing us by protecting our children, by taking care of our family, by giving us our parents. Yes, your parents get angry at you. That's okay, it's a global phenomenon. <laughs> they get angry at you. Those of you that are teenage boys, your father gets mad at you. It's gonna happen. He's gonna yell at you. Anyway, my dad, it's, he does not understand me. He doesn't know. He's always angry. But you know what? Alhamdulillah, he's alive. Alhamdulillah, you have an opportunity to show sabr to him and respect to him so you can earn Jannah with Allah. If you want to know if you're humble or not, see how you are to your parents. If you have an attitude with your parents, don't think about Islam. You're, you're not ready for like what Islam demands for your personality. Allah wants us to be humble. But humble does not mean you, you make salat like a perfect believer, but you show attitude to your father and your mother. Come on. That's not humility, you know. تِلْكَ الدَّارُ الْآخِرَةِ نَجْعُلُهَا لِلَّذِينَ لَا يُرِيدُونَ عُلُوًا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فَسَادًا The last home is built, by, built for people. Allah says we made the last home for people, Jannah for people who don't want to act up in this world. They don't act like this in this world. They don't show attitude. We have to learn to be humble to our parents, even if you think they're unfair. Even if you think they're unfair. That's part of appreciating the mercy and the love of Allah Azza wa Jal in our lives. This is something that one should think about every day. Just stop at Ar-Rahman. Just stop. And just think, what, what does that mean? What is Allah doing for me? How is, you know, the fact that, for example, it was a dream in my life, I wanted to come to Malaysia. I wanted to, I want to see the Muslims in Malaysia. Alhamdulillah, I'm so happy. I can't thank Allah enough for this opportunity. And just if you reflect about this, I'm on the other side of the planet from where I live. You know, Talking to you folks. Subhanallah. How, how does this happen? This does not happen except by the rahmah of Allah. How many things can go wrong on an airplane that's flying over the oceans? How many things? You see a little bit of turbulence and the taqwa goes up, right? <laughs> right? The, the, the plane goes down and the iman goes up. That's like how it works. <laughs> you know? 
Subhanallah. That's his care. He cares. And he cares about every one of us like that. Sometimes people get depressed. Allah doesn't care about me. Why do I have all these problems? You haven't thought about a Rahman enough. You haven't thought about that enough. You don't have to wait for his care to come. It's already there. It's already there. Before I move on to the second ayah, I've got to keep track of time too, my goodness. Okay, I've got a half an hour. I don't have much time at all. I want to tell you something so beautiful about this surah. Wallahi, one of the most beautiful things about Surah Ar-Rahman. The treasures of this surah don't come to an end. But just a few that I can share with you. You guys doing okay, by the way? How's the attention span? You getting sleepy yet? No? Okay, okay. So, the last ayah of this surah. Anybody know the last ayah of this surah? Tabaraka smu rabbika dil jalali wal ikram. The last ayah of this surah, Allah says that the name of Allah, the name of your Rabb, who is full of jalal, meaning jalal means glory that no, is not given to anybody else. Kalimat jalla la tusta'mal illa li rabbil alameen, illa lillah. The word jalla is not used except for Allah. You don't use, you know, dhul jalal for anyone other than Allah. You know, we say Allahu Azza wa Jal. Jalla is only for Allah. Now Allah says in that last ayah that the name of Allah is full of barakah. The name of Allah is full of barakah. Tabaraka smu rabbik. Tabaraka, the lazim form here, means something that is full of barakah. So we have to understand something about the word barakah. Just a little bit about the word barakah and which name. By the way, when Allah says the name of your master is full of barakah, did this surah begin with the name of Allah? Which name did it begin with? So Allah is telling us something about the word Ar-Rahman at the end of the surah. He's concluding with the beginning. He's telling us this name of Allah that I began with is full of barakah. Now it's Allah himself. Tabarak Allah. Allah himself is full of barakah. But Allah is not talking about himself. Allah is talking about his name. The name is full of barakah. So what does barakah mean? They say in Arabic, al-barakatu an-nama'u wa ziyada. Barakah first of all means growth. Something that rises. An-numu, progress. Something that goes further and further. And increase. Fawqa tawakku above expectation. If you put a seed in the ground, how many trees do you expect? One, you put a seed in the ground, you get ten trees. That's not expected. That's what you call baraka. Baraka means logic says I should get one tree, but I got a whole forest. How did that come? That's baraka. Logic says I did one little thing. I expected one, you know, in like the you know New Newton's laws, actions and reactions. Right? I did this action, I was expecting this reaction. But my one small action gave such a huge reaction. This must mean that the reaction has baraka. Baraka also in the Arabic language is used إِذَا أَنَاخَ الْجَمَلِ when, when the camel settles and it doesn't move. It doesn't move, which is beautiful. Because when you grow something and you grow it too much, kids here will understand this. I think everybody will understand this. You guys know what Legos are, right? Legos. If you make a really tall tower with Legos, you keep putting one on top of the other, on top of the other, standing up. Does the tower become more stable or less stable? Becomes less stable, it's going to fall. The higher it is, the more chances it will fall. Right? So when something becomes increased, it, has, it is less stable. But the word baraka means something that increases and is stable like a camel sunk in the sand. It doesn't move. In other words, don't think this increase will go away. It's not unstable increase. We know something about unstable increase in the United States. Our economy goes up really fast. And then what happens? <laughs> really fast you know it comes down really fast there are there are you know governments that take over really fast and when they take over really fast guess what they also disappear really fast happens all the time it happens all the time you know so you have trends fashions come really fast and then they disappear really fast this happens all the time but Allah says barakah is something that increases but it what it stays, it doesn't go away. And Allah says, His name is full of barakah. What does that mean for you and me? You know what that means? That when we say Allah's name, Ar-Rahman, and we do something in Allah's name, 
with Allah's name, calling on the barakah of Allah's name, then whatever we'll do, we do will produce good, but it will produce good more than expected, and the growth will continue and will not disappear. It'll keep going and going and going and going. You know, because of this one ayah, every Muslim is supposed to be an optimist. We, should, we can never be pessimists. Whatever you do, maybe, look, I'm standing here, there's thousands of you in the audience. There's so many others that are watching online. Thousands of you. But maybe one of you is a Quran teacher. And you don't have thousands of students, you have one student. You opened up your madrasa, you sat in the masjid, and one student came to you. One student. And you might think, how is this any... One, one, one guy shows up? What's the point? Imagine if I showed up here, we flew here, and one person was sitting in the audience. I'd be like... <laughs> <laughs> but actually this this is just what I see what you and I see the barakah in teaching one person the barakah in helping one person the barakah in doing one good deed after you say Bismillahi Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim the results of that you cannot calculate because they are from Allah and they will grow and grow beyond human expectation common sense logic mathematics cannot put it in, inside you cannot you cannot encompass it you don't know if that one child that you taught alif and ba to that one child is going to be the next mujaddid of this ummah that millions of people will take shahada because of his da'wah and you started him on his journey you don't know that i don't know that I can, remember, I can tell you personally a story of Barakah. I, when I started learning Arabic, the Arabic language, I was curious about the Qur'an. I read it in English, but I read the, like a Shakespearean English translation. It was really hard to understand because when I was reading Hast thou not seeneth, I was confused. Because I, I've never talked to my friend and say, Hast thou not seeneth this movie. Like, <laughs> I don't talk like that. So I, I couldn't figure out what it's saying, really. I had a hard time. So I decided, I found a teacher who said he can learn Arabic with me. And when we were in the Arabic class, I still remember, there were 10 students in the Arabic class at the masjid after Ramadan, 10 students on the first day. This class was going to go on for three weeks every day, every evening. 10 students the first day, 9 students the second day, 6 students the third day, 3 students the fourth day. And I look around and I'm like, should I also leave? I don't know. <laughs> and the teacher on the third or fourth day, he said, look, People will come and go. And even if none of you come, I will still be here waiting for you. I'll still be here waiting for you. You know why? Because when we do something for Allah, then we don't expect from people. We only expect from Allah. I get paid from Allah, not from you. I'm here for Allah. And when he said that, he believes in barakah. He believes in barakah. Now there's three of us sitting in this class. And even I'm sitting there learning this stuff. And I'm like, what's the point? You know, I might learn this in three weeks. But how am I going to do any more than that? I'm sitting in New York City. I don't have the money to go to Egypt or to go to Cairo or to go to like Morocco or go to Pakistan or Malaysia to study. And I don't have that. I, I got to sit here and get a, you know, I, I come from work and college and do this. For three weeks, what am I going to do after that? How am I ever going to learn? But when Allah puts barakah in something... <laughs> That's not up to us. That is not up to us. When I look back from since 1999 to now, the announcer said I've taught 10,000 students. In, all, in, in an accurate estimation, I would say, subhanAllah, till now, live audience, I must have taught at least 70, 80,000 people. Live audiences. And, and just the Arabic classes alone, not durus of Quran, Arabic classes. You know Arabic classes are boring, right? Arabic classes, at least, I know at least I've seen 20,000 people in Arabic classes. Physically, I've gone, you know, state to state in the United States and taught. I've seen that many people, you know, subhanAllah. And I did not, that's not from me. That's not from me. That's when Allah decides He'll give some barakah. That's, that's up to Him. Don't underestimate the value of the things that you do. Don't underestimate them. That's up to Allah. When He puts barakah in it, it will come beyond your expectations. You will never, min haythu la yahtasib. Allah will provide from where you can't even imagine. Okay, now I've, I, I, I wanted to stay until 9.30 for this talk. Is it okay with everybody if I go until 9.45? Is that okay? All right, if, if, if you're not okay with that, then the rest of us will beat you up. So, <laughs> so okay. Second ayah. 
Second ayah. Ar-Rahman wa Allama al-Qur'an. And I'll first talk to you about the two ayat together. Allama al-Qur'an khalaq al-insan. So many people here know the surah. Sabbih isma rabbika al-a'la alladhi khalaqa fasawwa walladhi qaddara fa hada. Allah says in surah al-a'la, he talks about himself, then he says he created. Alladhi khalaqa. He created. And in the next ayah he says, وَالَّذِي قَدَّرَ فَهَدَى He says he created and then he guided. So what was mentioned first? Creation was mentioned first. Then he talked about guidance. Ibrahim alayhi salam. أَلَّذِي خَلَقَنِي فَهُوَ يَهْدِينِي يَقُولْ أَلَّذِي خَلَقَنِي فَهُوَ يَهْدِينِي Allah is the one who created me and He is the one who guides me. What was mentioned first? Creation, then guidance. Surah Al-Rahman does not say, Ar-Rahman khalaq al-insan allam al-Qur'an. No. Ar-Rahman allam al-Qur'an khalaq al-insan. This time guidance is mentioned first, creation is mentioned second. It's unusual. It's unusual. Because the order of things is, Allah created me first, Allah created you first, and then He guided us. He guided us second, if you look at the order of things. But Allah breaks that order in this surah. I won't answer that question yet, I want to keep that question in your mind. Why is this sequence different? Why is guidance being mentioned before creation in this surah? But I want to talk to you about something else. Please pay attention to this part. One of the most important parts of today's dars. In a classroom, I've, I've, you know, this is not a classroom. This is a lecture. Some of you are on Facebook right now. Some of you are getting the best sleep of your life. Some of you are just looking around. Why is, what's going on here? I, where am I? Like, you know, that's happening. And some of you are paying attention. Some of you, you know, the eyes stay with me and then they start going up a little. Uh, you know, that happens to some of you. Then the best is when some of you are sitting like this, making eye contact with me and going. That means you have no idea what's going on, <laughs> right? So this is not a classroom because in a classroom, I check everyone. Hey, what did I just say? Hey, you, tell me what I just said. Hey, let's have a test right now. <laughs> That's what I do in a class. I constantly test. I constantly test. This is a lecture. This is, you could get away with anything. I say, how many kinds of communication are there? One guy in the back goes, 17. But it's okay, he can say that. Nobody, you know, I won't mind. It's fine. But you know what? When you're in a class, in a class, then the teacher's job is to make sure every student understands. Right? But sometimes there are some students, I, I still remember, I can give you an example. I prepared a lecture about Arabic, one of the lessons of Arabic grammar. I go to my class and I teach the lesson. I say, I, I spent two hours at night. How am I going to teach this lesson? This is going to be such an amazing lesson, they will give me an academy award after I finish teaching this lesson. So I teach this lesson. And I am so proud of myself, I start giving myself a pat on the back. That was amazing. Students are happy. One student raises his hand. He goes, after one hour, he goes, uh, Ustad? I was like, yeah? Uh, I don't understand. <laughs> what don't you understand? Uh, anything. <laughs> Okay, you don't understand anything. So let me start over. Let me give you the entire dars again. This time I will only make eye contact with you. Every two minutes I say, you okay? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You okay? Uh-huh, uh-huh. One whole hour goes by. I say, alhamdulillah. All the other students are like, why are we doing this again? But then this student raises his hand again. Ustad, I have a question. Yeah, he says, please ask your question. I, I still don't get it. Now, if you have ever been in a classroom, math class, English class, right? Islamic studies class, and a student does that. After the whole class is done, he, I, I don't understand. And he does it a second time. Is the teacher happy or angry? <laughs> yeah. We can't do that stuff in America, but I know I'm over here. In Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in India. I don't know if we're here. But we give our students a different kind of lesson after that. <laughs> <laughs> you know so <laughs> the students and then I say you know what 
school is over, all the kids are going home, why don't you stay in the office? I will sit in the office, I will not have lunch today, I will explain it to you again. I sit him down, I explain it to him again. Another way. If the first way didn't work and the second way didn't work, I'll find a third way to explain it to you. I finish explaining and he says, Ustad, I don't know if teaching is the right profession for you because I still, <laughs> I, 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 I don't understand. I, I don't get it. Have you tried taxi driving or anything else? Because clearly teaching isn't the right thing for you. So I say, okay, okay, I'm not giving up on you. Why don't you come to my house for dinner? As we eat dinner, I'll explain it to you again. Same thing after dinner, I say, why don't you move into my house? I <laughs> Does any teacher ever do that? Once a student says, I don't get it. The first time, maybe he's confused. The second time, maybe he's slow. The third time, he's just messing with you. He's just playing with you now. Now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the best teacher ever in human history. And not just history, even in the future of humanity, there will never be a better teacher than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in education, you need an excellent teacher and you need an excellent curriculum. And there will be never a better curriculum than the Qur'an. So you have the best teacher and you have the best curriculum. And the students were Quraysh. The students were all of Quraysh. And the lessons were easy. The lessons were not calculus. The lessons were not quantum physics. The lessons were simple. If I was talking to seven-year-old children and I was told, summarize the Makkan Qur'an. Makkan Qur'an is two-thirds of the Qur'an. Summarize it to these seven-year-old children in five minutes. I say, I don't need five minutes, I need one minute. Allah is one. Don't be like previous nations who didn't believe in Allah. Believe in his messengers, believe in the akhirah, be, 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 be a servant and slave to Allah. What else is there? It's done. Everything is covered. That's the entire Madani Makkan Quran. You know, that's the gist of it. The lessons are not hard. But how many years is the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, told to teach the same people, the same Quraysh? How many years he's teaching them? 12 years, over a decade. He's teaching the same people over and over again. And they hear the best lessons ever to be taught. And they listen to it in their custom language. Allah made it for them, for them especially. For that person who's talking to Rasulullah And ayah came from above to talk to that guy. And he says, I don't get it. Give me something else. I'm not impressed. Give me something else. Does Allah have a right to be angry? Allah has a right to be angry. Any normal teacher will be angry. Now even go a little step further. They don't just say, I don't understand. I told you they become stubborn. And when they become stubborn, they want to make fun of the ayat. And they make fun of the teacher, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They make fun of him. Does that make Allah angry? Yeah. It makes Allah very angry. And when Allah gets angry, what does he have the power to do? Subhanallah. Has he done it with previous nations before? He's done it. He's done it. But I want to tell you one of the last most offensive things that the Quraysh came up with. In the beginning they called him a liar, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then they called him crazy. They called him insane. They called him possessed by a jinn. They said that he's stealing from the Jews and the Christians. They came up with all kinds of allegations. But at the end of it all, you know what they said? They said, you keep talking about Yawmul Qiyamah. You keep talking about Jahannam. You keep talking about Jannah. You keep talking about angels. You keep talking about Allah. You keep talking about all this stuff that we can't see. Show me something. Bring the dead back to life. Turn this mountain into gold. Let's see the day of judgment. Let's see this punishment you keep talking about. Innahum yarawnahu ba'idan wa narahu qariban. Give me the pro they say well, yes bil adab Quran tells us they're telling you hurry up and bring the punishment let's have it I've been listening about it for 10 years now I'm tired of it you said it's near how don't see it near let's see it let's see some action already you know what that means there's, there's a saying we have in America I'll tell you the saying they say I'll believe it when I see it that's what they said if you don't have something to show me don't waste my time 
I don't want to hear this Quran stuff. I'll believe it when I see it. I had a student like that in college when I used to teach in college. I used to teach Arabic and most of my students were non-Muslims. And a guy came up to me and he is, is, is a student, he said, Professor, I like Islam. I like it. It's cool. But I just, you know, I haven't seen anything. Can you take me to like a jinn possession or something? <laughs> if I could just see something, I, you know, I'd be good. This surah, this beginning is the answer to that problem. Let me tell you, you guys have traffic problems in Malaysia, yes? Does the news, the radio tell you about traffic problems? Yeah? So you're driving on the highway and it's no traffic, zero traffic. It's, I mean, this is like amazing. And you're flooring the car and you don't see any car in front of you. You turn the radio on and it says two kilometers ahead of you. You see, I didn't say miles, I said kilometers. I'm proud of myself. <laughs> two kilometers ahead of you. Two kilometers ahead of you, there's an accident, there's really bad traffic. If you can take an exit, take the exit. That's what the radio tells you. Do you see the accident? No. You don't see the accident. But do you take the exit? If you listen to the radio and says an accident, is a five hour delay. Will you take the exit or no? Yeah, you'll take the exit. I mean, maybe in America, you'll listen to the radio and say, oh, I don't listen to the kuffar, I'm going to go into the traffic jam or something. <laughs> but... You know, but you know, you, you'll take the exit. You know why? Because news came to you from a reliable source. The reporter sees something that you don't see and you trust him. You don't say, ah, these radio people, I will believe it when I see it. And you will go <laughs> and get stuck in, ah, I believe now. <laughs> there really is an accident. Like, what's the point now, buddy? <laughs> Allah Azza wa Jal created human beings, right? And human beings are able to think and understand things even if they haven't seen them. Animals are not like that. If for example, we made an announcement, brothers and sisters, please leave the building from this exit. If we made that announcement, we would start leaving from this exit. But if there was a cat in the building, if there was a fly in the building, if there was a dog, it won't be a dog, but whatever, it wouldn't leave. Why not? It doesn't have the ability to understand speech. But if an animal sees a fire, will it leave? When it sees a danger, will it leave? An animal will only behave when it sees. But a human being can behave when he understands, when she understands, right? Allah says, that he taught the Qur'an and he didn't give you anything else to believe. He gave you Qur'an's enough. Qur'an's enough for you. You know, there are other small miracles here and there, but the main message of Islam is the Qur'an itself. The miracle is Qur'an itself. Why? Because human beings are human beings. They're not animals. You don't have to see to believe. You can think about it and you can believe. That's why he says, عَلَّمَ Quran and what? خَلَقَ insan. He taught the Qur'an because he created the human being. You people aren't animals. If you say, I will only believe when I'll see, you're acting like a goat. You're acting like a cow. You're acting like a monkey, but you're not acting like a human. A human being can reason. The Qur'an is appealing to reason. Now, the final bit of this عَلَّمَ Quran connection. I told you a teacher will get angry, right? A teacher will get angry. But this teacher... Because he calls himself Allah al Quran, he taught the Quran, so he's a teacher. Allah took the role of Mu'allim in this ayah. A teacher has a right to get angry, but he called himself Ar Rahman first. He is a kind of teacher that has the kind of love and care and concern and mercy on top of all of that, even for the people who hate his messenger, even for them. And he taught them the Qur'an even when they insulted his messenger. He taught them the Qur'an even when they tried to kill the messenger. He taught them the Qur'an when, he, when they killed innocent people in front of him. When they made fun of the ayat. When they rejected one surah, he revealed another and another and another and another. And because he kept on revealing, that is proof that he is Ar-Rahman. Because if he was not Rahman, this would not have happened. You would have been killed a long time ago. You would have been dead. You would not have been around. What we are learning in this surah from the very beginning is the Qur'an came down as an act of Allah's love. 
there is so much propaganda against Islam today. When people think about the Qur'an, non-Muslims unfortunately, when they think about the Qur'an, they think about violence, they think about hate, they think about hell, they think about a God that punishes. That's what they think about. And you know what's even more unfortunate? When Muslims today think about the Qur'an, they think about, oh, Qur'an just says everything's haram. Qur'an just says people will go to hellfire. Qur'an just says that we, you know, we're not good enough, etc., etc. You have to understand something about Allah introducing the Qur'an. The Qur'an is an act of Allah's love. Is an act of Allah's care. You want to get to know Allah's love and care? Study the Qur'an. You want to know how He shows you love? Learn the Qur'an. And you will learn something about Allah you didn't know before. It will move you to tears. It will move you. Get to know Allah like you never did before. Now you, you can imagine. To put things in perspective. I am sending... If I wrote you an email, how many of you are here? <laughs> how many can I write a personal email? How much am I going to write? How, how am I going to personalize an email? Allah Azza wa Jal gave us an entire set of letters. Risalati Rabbi, Quran calls it. Letters from Allah. Messages from Allah. Personalized for us. Each and every one of us. 600 pages worth. 600 pages worth. Allah talking to me and Allah talking to you personally that we're supposed you know nobody cries when they think about someone else they cry when they think about themselves the people who cry when they make salah is because they they heard something about themselves Allah is sending you a personal guidance me a personal guidance my message to you tonight because of Ar-Rahman is that we have to build a personal relationship with the Quran it has to be that way if you want to experience what Ar-Rahman means then you have to become a student of the Quran Let's talk about Allama al-Qur'an a little bit. Just a little bit. You know the word Allama in Arabic, taf'il, it actually means to deliver knowledge over a long period of time. A long period of time. There is no rush. You don't have to learn the whole Qur'an right now. Not this month. You don't have to do that. Just learn a little bit at a time, but continuously. The best student of the Qur'an in history is Rasulullah himself sallallahu alayhi wa He is also the best teacher and also the best student. And as a student, Allah taught him for how long? 23 years. He taught him the Qur'an. We're not in a hurry. We can take our time. Don't feel intimidated. I don't know all the surahs. I haven't read the whole thing. I don't know all of tafsir. It's okay. That's not the point. The point is you start somewhere. Start memorizing a little bit. Start learning a little bit. A little bit at a time. That's all that Allah is asking from us. That's what He's asking from us. Every day, especially for the young people here. I am telling you, when you have a daily relationship with the Qur'an, with understanding, it'll change the way you think. It'll change the kind of friends you have. It'll change what you want to do with your spare time. It'll make you people of vision. We need young Muslims to be people of vision. You need to be people that want to change society and make it better. You don't want to be people of video games and movies and sleep. You don't want to be those people. Because first come video games and movies and sleep, then smoking, then drugs, then alcohol. And that's, that's life wasted. These are lives, hundreds of thousands of lives wasted. Not just of non-Muslims, these are problems of Muslim youth today. Muslim youth have no purpose today. Why is that? Because the book that gives us purpose, we're disconnected from it. We're disconnected from that book. We have to reconnect with this book. This is, our, this is a, a really serious obligation we have in the Ummah to help the people come closer to this book and not scare people from this book and push them away from this book. SubhanAllah. This book is even inviting the hateful, stubborn people. It began with Ar-Rahman. They were stubborn and Allah began with Ar-Rahman. How are we supposed, you know, when people get angry at the youth that they're away from the deen, I don't get angry at them. I get angry at people like myself. We haven't done enough. They would not have gone away if they knew what this was. And they don't know what this is because we're not doing our job. Those of us that should be teaching should be teaching more. And those of you that are youth that are of concern, become people of concern for others. You know, there's a difference between a da'i and a alim. You don't have to be a alim. You don't have to be a faqih. To share the Qur'an with somebody. The Qur'an has some ayat that are very complicated. I'm not saying you should give a khutbah about inheritance law tomorrow. I'm not saying that. 
But when Allah says, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ You can share that with your friends. You can say something nice about Allah and His Messenger through Allah's book with each other. You can make it a means of reminder. That's what it was supposed to be. That's really what it was supposed to be. You know, this is Allah al Quran. First of all, take your time. Take your time. Second of all, and this is my, my, one of my last points with you guys tonight, inshallah. How many people, university students? You know, there's one thing true about university students and even graduates. They're very proud of their school. Whatever college you go to, you may hate it right now, but when you graduate and you get the diploma, you're going to put it on the wall. You're going to be proud that you graduated from this school. You're going to feel a sense of like accomplishment and prestige. That's why the graduation ceremony is a, a ceremony where you are honored. Even in Islamic studies, when you get an ijaza, like you get an ijaza in tajweed, you're very proud that you got your ijaza from this shaykh or that shaykh, right? Because it's a matter of prestige. When people in the United States go to Harvard or they go to Columbia, or they go to NYU, they go to these elite schools, they're very proud that they went to these colleges. People are proud to have a certain shaykh as a teacher. They're proud of that. It's a matter of honor. When Allah says, He taught the Qur'an, who's the teacher? Allah is. And if He's the teacher, what does that make you and me? Students, how honored are you and me that our teacher is Allah? Our teacher is Allah. And he didn't even say, عَلَّمَ nas al-Qur'an, عَلَّمَ kum al-Qur'an, عَلَّمَ nabiyahu al-Qur'an. He said, عَلَّمَ al-Qur'an, he taught the Qur'an. Who did he teach? He didn't even limit it. So the invitation is open, anybody who wants to learn. Anybody who wants to learn, come on and learn. Allah did not close that door. If you're 50 years old in the audience and you don't know how to read Qur'an, it is okay, start now, fine. Don't be ashamed. Start now, start a little bit, you know. And other people in our community, when somebody comes to you from the, at the masjid, or somebody comes to you privately and says, look, I'm a professional, I'm an accountant, I'm a doctor, I'm a dentist, I'm an engineer, but I don't know anything about the Qur'an, I can't even read. Last time I read, I was eight years old. Don't be angry at them and say, Astaghfirullah, how could you do that? Don't do that, man. They came to you. They came to you. Respect those people, honor those people. Maybe Allah sees them as more valuable than you, what you've been doing. They made hijrah to Allah, they stepped on their pride, they're so educated in their field, but they admitted their ignorance of this in front of someone else. That's humility before Allah, Allah loves humility. We have to honor those people, we have to make, inv invite those people, make them feel welcome, you know. This is what we have to do. And our Muslim society is like that, not all of us are literate in the Qur'an. Not everybody knows what the Qur'an means, not everybody knows how to recite the Qur'an or even how to memorize. Well, you know what? It is the job of our masajid and it is the job of our ulama and our du'at and the young people that are students of deen. It is your job to make the deen inviting for everybody else. Don't be angry at those people that don't pray. Don't care for them. If you don't care about them, you will never bring them to this deen. You cannot be da'is if you don't care about people. You have to care about society. Don't drive by the neighborhoods that have a bar and a club and a movie theater and go astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. You have to care about, that's your country. Those are your people. You have to care about them. You have to invite them. Some one of your friends is going there, you say, hey bro, let's go play soccer. Let's play, sorry, football. Let's play football instead. You know, let's go to the masjid and hang out. Let's go, you know, eat some, eat some uh, prata. You know, let's do something else. You, you have to do that. Stop being angry at the people that are not in the masjid. They're also our people. They're also our ummah. They are just the lost sheep of La ilaha illallah. That's who they are. Allah did not close the invitation even to the worst kuffar. How can we close the invitation from our fellow Muslim brothers and sisters? How can we do that? How can those sisters here that are wearing hijab look with hateful eyes to the woman that doesn't wear hijab? She doesn't wear hijab because maybe nobody taught her. Maybe she doesn't know why she should wear it. Maybe she asked her parents, why should I wear hijab? And they didn't know how to answer her. And it's a fair question. It deserves an answer. Maybe they weren't able to answer her. And she says, maybe there's no reason to do it. I don't have a good enough reason. Maybe if somebody actually talked to her and respected her and treated her like a dignified human being, she would change her mind. You don't know that. So we have to have that attitude and concern. 
Wallahi, this is the sunnah of our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to teach the Qur'an with love even to those who hate. To teach it with love even to those who hate. So then he says, Khalaq al-insan. My final words to you guys, inshaAllah ta'ala. I know I said final before. This is final, final. Khalaq al-insan. You know the word insan, Ibn al-Faris argued it could be two origins. It could be nasiya, means human beings are very forgetful. Or it could be from uns, which means human beings are very loving. Alligators are not very loving. Lions are not very loving. You know? Other animals, they have some love, but not like human beings. We can even show love to other animals. We can show love to other human beings. We can show love to strangers, right? We have that ability. So we have uns in us. They are wahsh and we are uns. So there's two meanings to the human being. One that we are forgetful and the second that we have what? Love. Allah chose this message perfectly for people who are forgetful. For people who are forgetful. Because when people forget, what do they need? Reminder, and one of the names of the Qur'an is Reminder In huwa illa dhikrun Kalla innaha tadhkira Wa dhakkir bil Qur'an man yakhafu wa'id Qur'an is reminder Because we are insan So he says, I taught the Qur'an because you're insan <laughs> You forget, that's why I gave you a reminder You keep forgetting, so I keep reminding you over and over again That's why I did that, subhanallah And the second is love you, are, you don't just give love, you are looking for love. If you're looking for love and you have a hole in your heart that you need to fill, this word of Allah will fill it. This word of Allah will give you, you'll appreciate the love Allah has for you. The honor He's given us. How high His word is. وَكَلِمَةُ هِيَ الْعُلْيَا He says in Surah At-Tawbah. The word of Allah is the highest there is. There's nothing higher than the word of Allah. Al-Ulya, the super, superlative form is used. You know what that means? There's nothing higher than the word of Allah. And yet that word of Allah, anzalahu, he sent it down. Can you imagine? The highest thing was sent down. For who? For you and me. That's, that's, a, that's what you call a gift. I, I, I don't deserve that gift and you don't deserve that gift. That is an act of love of Allah. Who is going to accept that invitation from Allah? If Allah called Himself a teacher, who will refuse to be a student? You know? And if you start now, I don't care if you're 70 or 7, if you turn to Allah and say, Ya Allah, I want to learn your book. I want, you called yourself a teacher and I want, to, I want Ar-Rahman to be my teacher so I'm ready to be his student. Then it does not matter whether you know a little bit or you know a lot. Because you began with Ar-Rahman, there will be Barakah in your learning. And when there's barakah in your learning, you will learn like you have never learned before. Never. You are a bad student in mathematics. You are terrible in English class. You are horrible in history class. But when you turn to Allah's book and you want to learn Arabic, which is a complicated language. It's complicated. You want to learn tafsir and tajweed and memorize. If your intentions are, I want Allah's love and mercy, then Allah will open doors in your brain you didn't know existed. And it'll become easy for you like nothing else. You know, in college, I was a terrible student. Terrible. I, I was a bad student. I, I used to have, I only signed up for the courses in college that my friend took. Because he would take the notes. I slept on his so shoulder for four years. <laughs> you know, I also have a lot of elbow marks on my arm because he tried to wake me up. I was a terrible student. But when I started learning Quran, in Arabic, I did not have to review twice. I learned something once and it came in my head. It's not because I'm smart, because I know how dumb I am. I, I'm, a test I'm a witness to myself. Allah makes things easy. Allah makes it easy. We don't make that, make that easy. You make the intention and Allah will make that easy for you. This is the message I want to share with all of you, really. I want you to become students of this book. Students of this language. Don't be intimidated by it. Don't be intimidated by it. In my conclusion, as I leave you this, this announcement, it's really just an announcement. I've, st I've dedicated myself to a project. My project is I want to try to help as many Muslims in the Ummah that can speak English. At least because we have a common, common language then. If you can speak English, I want to be able to help you learn the language of the Qur'an and understand the Qur'an better than you do now. 
Maybe I can become the first step for you in learning the Quran. And then when you become, when you get through that first step, you can start learning more advanced things from the ulama in your communities and other more advanced resources. But everybody needs a first step. Everybody needs something to, to get started with. I want to be able to offer that first step to you. What I did in my own family, I decided to teach my daughter. I teach my daughter maybe 10-15 minutes of Arabic a day. And I record it. I record the class. And I put it up on our website, on bayina.tv. Right? And subhanAllah, at this point, we have close to 7,000 people that are learning Arabic with Husna. I met some people that were asking about Husna, I know why. Right? Because they're learning Arabic with her. I put up a translation of the entire Qur'an, a video translation of the entire Qur'an, briefly explaining the Qur'an. So at least your first exposure of the Qur'an is done with some guidance. You know sometimes when you read translation you get confused? What's this here? What does that mean? How does that apply? So at least giving it some context and helping you kind of walk you through the Qur'an. A guided walk through the Qur'an. It's called cover to cover. We put that up on bayinat.tv also. I want eventually this to be a resource for Islamic schools, for parents, for children, for adults, for people that want to learn in later on in life. I want it to be a library of videos that are consecutive that you can do on your own time. Because I know people have different schedules, you have different obligations, and this is really something I feel very strongly about. That inshallah ta'ala in the coming years, I hope to offer as much Quran education as, as I possibly can in one place so that people can benefit from it on their own time. And people can take the opportunity to learn as a family, which is really important. To learn Quran as a family. So I'm requesting all of you, inshallah ta'ala, to, if you get a chance to check out bayyina.tv, B-A-Y-Y-I-N-A-H, that's how bayyina is spelled, bayyina.tv, I would truly appreciate that. I hope to see, I think, uh, I know the signups are all filled up, but I hope to see many of you tomorrow as well, inshallah ta'ala. I know there are a lot of people that are going to try to take pictures and stuff. We're going to make salat first, okay? We're going to make salat, and then we're going to do group pictures. So like a group of 50 at one time, so I don't like die of photography today. Because that's kind of important. And the other thing I'll do, inshallah ta'ala, is I'm going to try to go, I'm going to try to give the sisters, because I want people to leave in a timely fashion, I'm going to try to give the sisters maybe, you know, 20, 30 minutes, as many questions as I can try and answer in the back, and then I'll stay here as long as you guys have questions, inshallah ta'ala, I'll try to stay as long as I can. So I'm not going anywhere, I'm not going to hide in some VIP room somewhere. I'm going to be here. I, I want to talk to you guys, inshallah ta'ala, I want to gain some perspective from you. But, you know, I, I'd really rather say salams to you and uh, maybe not too many hugs because hugs can also kill people if they're, if they're this many hugs they can, they can kill people but inshallah ta'ala I'd love to say salam to all of you and meet as many of you as I can I know this is if, if I gave every person in this audience one minute if I talk to you for one minute <laughs> that's a few thousand minutes that's, that's a few days right? right but that's why we hope that we're going to meet each other in Jannah we got all the time in the world we can sit and talk it's all good. We can put the day on pause and just talk, you know, and get to know one another. And we pray that Allah gathers us in a gathering much better than this gathering, you know, that, that, that we can enjoy and remember the, the way we met each other in this way and how the company in Jannah will be so much better. Barakallahu li walakum. Thank you so very much for attending tonight. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.